200 hours where it really meant something to you and you can talk about it is much better than 2,000 hours where you were just doing it to check a box. Ask Dr. Gray, pre-med Q&A brought to you by Blueprint MCAT. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I am wonderful. What can I help you with? So um, my main question today is just about shadowing. Um, I know shadowing is a really important part of the application process and all that good stuff. And I really just don't have any. I mean, I have a little bit, but not nearly enough. And I just don't even know how to go about getting shadowing. My shadowing from the past was just with my family practitioner. So I knew him personally, well, sort of personally. And yeah, just whenever I've looked into getting shadowing, I just, I don't know. I can never figure out the best way to go about it. And I think part of it is just me being a little shy and like Mm -hmm. not wanting to put myself out there. But I was just wondering if you've had any tips for that. Yeah. Put yourself out there. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the, the best way to get shadowing is to get lots of people to say no to you. And then someone will eventually say yes. Uh, yeah. obviously during COVID shadowing was really hard to get. And depending on what area of the country you're in, it still may be hard, but if you can show that you're vaccinated and, uh, all this fun stuff, then potentially that opens up some opportunities for you. But it, it literally is emailing, emailing, calling, calling, finding out, uh, asking questions, networking with friends and family members to see if they know anyone who may allow you to shadow. It's typically easier to shadow in smaller kind of private practices than big academic medical centers where they're inundated with students to begin with. Yeah. And so it's it's just put yourself out there and and be okay with rejection because that's how you get to the yeses. Yeah. The the I, other thing to think about is is virtual shadowing. And if you're not doing that, then then you're missing out. Yeah, I've done I have about eight hours of in-person shadowing and then about eight hours of virtual shadowing. And I've been planning on continuing with the virtual. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think my issue has been just going. I usually do on I've Whenever I look for shadowing, I go for like the big medical centers nearby and it's, you know, I can never even find the physician's information. It's always just like some generic phone number or, yeah. you know, they never have their emails po- posted for the most part from what I've found. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But so along with that, I'm starting my, I'm a rising senior. Okay. So I'm hoping to apply next cycle and i I'm just wondering, do you think it's going to look like I tried to cram a ton of shadowing like the last year before I applied is a year too little time? I don't think so. I I think with COVID, there's there's uh, obviously uh, an excuse for why you may have a big gap in shadowing. So I I don't think it's an issue. Okay, gotcha. Um, Cool. So. Another thing I've been wondering is, you know, I watch your videos all the time and I like to watch the application renovation videos a lot. And I've noticed with those that it seems like a lot of people have like thousands of hours of activities and all of this. And I'm, I do a lot of things and I'm fairly consistent, but I just don't have, you know, thousands of hours of research or clinical experience or anything like that. So I guess I'm wondering is it, do you think it's more important to be fairly consistent with the things I'm doing or do I really need like, you know, a thousand of, or a thousand hours of research a year, you know? Yeah. That's- yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> you, <laughs> I guess you I never d- understand. You don't need thousands of hours of something <laughs> to do well. You just, you need to do what you're doing. You need to have it mean something to you and you're not just doing it to check a box. 200 hours where it really meant something to you and you can talk about it is much better than 2000 hours where you were just doing it to check a box. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I, part of the issue for me is I'm, I guess somewhat of a non-traditional applicant Mm -hmm. where I um, got my associate's degree in high school and I transferred all those credits to a state school. So when I apply, I'll be 20. So I've only really had, you know, two years of like real undergrad per se. So, you know, that's just a caveat. I know of applying young, but as a result of that, I haven't been able to get as many hours, but yeah. 
yeah, I have been. That's a reason. Yeah, for sure. But I'm also, I, I will be taking a gap year. Like I said, I'll apply next cycle. So I'll have that year in between. Um, well, hopefully one gap year, maybe more if I don't get in. But yeah. <clears throat> so with the gap year, I know you say, you know, we can project out our hours um well it's but, it's very different now so all of the stuff i've said in the past with projecting hours has changed because amcas has updated their application now to where they actually have a discrete separate uh question that that they now frame as completed hours and then anticipated hours so okay. now you don't really project out in the past where you just kind of put it all into one they actually have a whole separate section of each activity that says, how many hours do you anticipate getting? Okay, gotcha. Because my my plan was um, to hopefully get a position in a clinical setting or maybe research, but I'm more leaning towards a clinical setting for the year, you know, work full time and get a lot of hours. <clears throat> but, you know, since I'm applying around the time I would be getting a job, I don't know, like, how much that's going to impact my application, I guess, you know? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think because you're not going to have much to say about it, mm -hmm. uh, because if you're, if you're not starting it until maybe after you apply or right when you're applying, then you'd really don't have much to say about it other than I'm doing this thing. Gotcha. Yeah. I've been considering hopefully getting the job like over winter break and then starting working part-time and then transitioning to full-time. That way I can actually have something to say about that. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm thinking. Um, but yeah, another question I had was, you know, I mentioned earlier that I will be 20 when I apply, mm -hmm. um, you know, assuming, I mean, I'm, I'm planning on getting shadowing by the time I apply and I will have quite a few clinical hours, but I'm, I am worried about my age impacting my application because, yeah. you know, I'll be 20 when I apply, hopefully 21 when I would start medical school. Um, if I have, you know, the things that you're supposed to have, do you think that that's going to be a major deterrent for me? I don't think it would be a major deterrent. I think it it potentially is an issue because there's, there's an assumption uh, that younger equals less mature. And uh, typically the issue that comes into play is, is less hours and less impactful hours and an inability to talk about why you're doing this and, and uh, reflect on those experiences because there aren't as many to, to talk about why you want to be a doctor and, and reflect on, on other parts of your application and uh, behavioral type questions of like, oh, tell me about a time where you were a leader and this and that because you just, with your age, you haven't had those experiences typically. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, cool. And then I just had a couple kind of random questions about the application itself. Um, I know that you can put most meaningful experience for, I think, three things. Yep. Um, and, you know, I've kind of been thinking about what I want to put on there and how I'm going to describe all of these things and what stories I'm going to tell and all that. Um, and I guess I'm just not really sure what the protocol is for choosing your most meaningful experiences. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, obviously my clinical experience, I want that to be there because that has been really impactful on me. But I also do um, youth coaching for rock climbing, mm -hmm. and I've been doing that for about three years now, and that's been really impactful for me. But since it's not clinical, you know, is it okay to put that as a most meaningful experience? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So it's a it's a big um, kind of misinterpretation or a misunderstanding of that most meaningful part of an of the AMCAS application, mm -hmm. uh, and TMDSAS also has a most meaningful section as well, is the most meaningful is not most meaningful clinical, most meaningful to you on your path to becoming a physician. It's most meaningful to you as a person. Gotcha. And so putting sports in there, putting hobbies in there, talking about coaching, rock climbing, I think are great examples of, of probably your truth as a human being in terms of uh, what what lights you up, what you're passionate about. And then along the same lines of the application, I 
So I, last summer, I uh, got my license as an EMT. Mm-hmm. And when doing that, I did um, the clinicals that you have to do, you know, to apply for the license and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And that was really impactful on me. There was a lot of stuff that went on that I want to talk about in my application. Um, but I'm just not sure where something like EMT clinicals fits in, or if I could even put that on there. Cause you know, it was like 25, 24 hours of clinicals, but it wasn't like volunteering. It wasn't work. Is that more something that I might want to talk about in my personal statement since it was so impactful or could I actually put that as an activity, like my EMT licensure? So you can put it as an activity, I don't think it's super impactful because getting a certificate is not as impactful as what do you do with that certificate? What do you do with that training? So Mm -hmm. if you haven't worked as an EMT, then putting the certificate as an activity all by itself to me is less impactful, but you can definitely do it. You can put it on there. Okay. Yeah. I was not as much like the license itself, but just the clinicals that I had to do to get the license, I was working in an ER Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, had a lot of patient interaction. Yeah. You you can put that on there. Okay, cool. Perfect. Um, yeah, I think those are all the main questions I had. Um, okay. So for, for MCAT prep, I'm assuming you haven't taken your MCAT yet. Um, what? (laughs) Oh no, I'm I'm studying for it now. I'm taking it in August. Taking it in August. So one of the biggest mistakes that students make is studying, just reading and reading and reading and reading and reading all of the content. So one of the biggest things that you need to do is take full length exams. Mm-hmm. And our sponsor, Blueprint MCAT, has the second best exams out there. So if you uh, need some full length exams, go check them out. And and I say second best uh, as kind of a jest because. The AAMC obviously is the the first best exams out there, but for a third party test prep, Blueprint exams has ten exams for you. You get one for free if you sign up for a free account if you haven't already at Blueprint MCAT. Yeah, I actually just took the free. I took the diagnostic in May, nice. and I took the free full length last Thursday. Yeah, how'd it go? And I just, I mean, it went really well. I, well, the diagnostic went terribly, of course. <laughs> of course, I got like a four ninety four. But I was expecting that. Yep. Um, and after six weeks of content review and practice questions, my score went up 12 points. Awesome. So, yeah, I think hopefully in another eight weeks, I'm hoping to get this, a decent score. We'll yeah. see. Well, good, yeah, good, good luck. Not, I'll back. Yeah. Thank you. Good luck. All right. Well, thanks for coming on and asking some great questions. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Bye.